Previously on The War That Made America. Fire! At age 22, a naive George Washington triggers a war between Britain and France that will decide the fate of North America. But it's the native people who hold the balance of power here. Neither side will win without them. British arrogance leads to a bloody disaster on the Monongahela River. Many Indians join the French, the winning side. Terror becomes a potent weapon. Now George Washington must do his best to defend the Virginia frontier. When the war spreads from the Ohio River Valley to upstate New York, the British make a desperate stand. It ends in gentlemanly surrender when the defeated English general graciously entertains his French victors. But when the French shun their native allies, the Indians take matters into their own hands. The following summer, the British vow once again to defeat the French in North America. And this time, they are leaving nothing to chance. This program is made possible by Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments, Eden Hall Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the following. It is now three years into this war, the French and Indian War. After a series of humiliating defeats to the French, the British have appointed a new commander-in-chief. Major General James Abercrombie is mobilizing the largest army ever seen in North America. Over 15,000 men and 18 massive siege cannon. More than enough to crush the French forces. His plan is to follow the highway of water north from New York City to Montreal, the heart of French Canada. Along the way, he must take the French fort Carillon, what the English call Fort Ticonderoga, that guards the crucial water passage from Lake George into Lake Champlain. On July 5, 1758, Abercrombie's fleet set sail toward Ticonderoga. 1,000 boats cover Lake George from one side to the other.
As he waits for the British to arrive, the commander of the French forces in North America, 46-year-old Louis Joseph, the Marquis de Montcalm, knows how precarious France's position has become. We are faced with the imminent loss of Canada. The English have 20 battalions. We have eight. Our circumstances require decisive and determined measures. It is no longer the time when a few scalps or the burning of a few houses is any advantage. Action, scrupulous and well-considered use of men and time is all that can compensate. The Marquis knows that this upcoming battle has become part of a much bigger story. It began in North America, but by 1758, this war is a global conflict. France and Britain and their respective allies are battling in Germany over who will control Northern Europe. In West Africa, they are fighting to control the slave trade. And even in far off India, they battle for a piece of Asia. It will become known to history as the Seven Years' War, an epic struggle to determine who will rule the greatest empire since ancient Rome. Britain's King George II, a Protestant? Or the French King Louis XV, a Catholic? In North America, the outcome of this war should have been easy to predict. The British colonists outnumbered the French by 18 to 1. But what Britain didn't have was the one thing it needed most, the support of the Indian nations. It was the Indians who would determine the victory in North America. And until the British figured that out, they would never be able to turn the tide. The main action of the war is unfolding in the Northeast. But there is another front, an almost forgotten one, on the Western frontier. That's where George Washington has been posted for two years. At age 25, he is commander of the Virginia Regiment, an undermanned force expected to defend the frontier from Indian raids. But his enemy is elusive. The campaign has been unsuccessful and frustrating. I am tired of this place, the inhabitants, and the life I lead here. So far, Washington can claim only one military engagement that wasn't a failure, a skirmish with the French that helped trigger this war. Since then, his two major battles have both ended badly. One when he surrendered to a larger French and Indian force. The other, the disastrous defeat of General Edward Braddock in 1755. Now Washington's military career is stalled, and his health precarious. My strongest representations relative to the peace of the frontier are disregarded as idle and frivolous. My orders, dark, doubtful, and uncertain. Today approved, tomorrow condemned. I am left to proceed at hazard accountable for the consequences and blamed without benefit of defense. <laughs> Worst of all, 
He feels he and his men are treated as inferiors by the British regular army. However, I am determined to bear up under all the embarrassments some time longer. To plead the case for his men and himself, Washington makes a visit to the new British commander for North America, John Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, an aristocratic Scotsman with little patience for colonials. Washington hopes to overcome the handicap of being born an American. He believes his service on the frontier has earned him an officer's commission in the regular British Army, not merely the provincial forces. Washington writes to the general in preparation for his visit. Although I have not the honor to be known to your lordship, yet your name was familiar to my ear on account of the important services performed to his majesty in other parts of the world. Do not think, my lord, that I mean to flatter. My nature is honest and free from guile. It doesn't work. Loudon keeps him waiting for several days, then finally grants him an audience. There's no record of what was said, but from all accounts, it didn't go the way Washington had hoped. Your Lordship, I trust you have had the opportunity to study my petition. Colonel Washington, I see no reason to alter the current provisions. The regiment performs a useful function on the frontier, and I shall require it to continue in that capacity. But, Your Lordship... You shall maintain your position at Winchester. It may be the lowest point in the young man's life. George Washington would never again seek a British commission. Chronically ill with dysentery and worried he has tuberculosis, now Loudon's ordered him to stay on the forgotten western frontier indefinitely. That will be all, Colonel. Thank you. In January 1758, Washington takes sick leave from the army and returns home to run Mount Vernon, the large estate he's inherited. Unlucky in war, he's also unlucky in love. The woman he wanted, a well-known beauty named Sally Fairfax, has married one of his best friends. Meanwhile, Lord Loudon has problems of his own. Loudon needs men and money to fight the French, but the colonial assemblies are not cooperating. Massachusetts is being particularly difficult. How can we, in good conscience, supply our men in this conflict? The colonial legislators are asking for the same rights historically accorded to the British subjects of the king, that they give their consent to being taxed. If his lordship, if anyone compels us to pay a penny and we submit, then he may compel us to pay a pound, a fart for his troops then. <laughs> But to Loudon, it's beyond comprehension that these colonials could refuse his orders. But refuse they did. Money and principles were driving a wedge between the British and the colonists. The colonists feared that this expensive war would bankrupt their governments. But more than that, they feared it would destroy their rights. The colonists were putting the crown on notice that they would not stand to be treated as inferiors. They saw themselves as full-fledged subjects of the king who just happened to live on the western side of the Atlantic. Just when the impasse seems unbreakable, 
two letters arrive from William Pitt, a brilliant politician who has joined the king's government as prime minister. Sir, the king having judged proper that the Earl of Loudon should return to England. <laughs> the first letter fires Loudon. Even better, the second letter promises reimbursement for military expenses. To furnish all the men so raised with arms, ammunition, and tents. Ha <laughs> ha! By simply granting the colonists most of what they want, Pitt changes the mood overnight. Unlike his predecessors, he understands that the colonists yearn to be recognized as loyal members of the British Empire. He knows that to win this war, Britain needs the full participation of these troublesome British subjects. These demanding and headstrong colonists. These Americans. Pitt's new policies make all the difference to Britain's ability to fight the war. Thousands of colonials join General Abercrombie's army. By July 1758, when he is ready to attack Fort Ticonderoga, Abercrombie has a force of nearly 16,000 men, more than the population of Boston. This will be a fully allied effort Provincials fighting alongside British redcoats. On July 6th, General Abercrombie lands his massive army at the northern end of Lake George, just a few miles from Fort Ticonderoga. Then he halts to regroup and waits a full day. That day provides an unexpected opportunity for the Marquis de Montcalm. Outnumbered five to one, low on supplies, he knows his fort can't withstand British cannon fire. So he takes a desperate gamble. He orders his men out of the fort and brings them nearly a mile forward toward the British. At the top of a hill, he builds a defensive wall of felled timbers. In front of the wall, Montcalm orders a barrier of sharpened treetops, an abati. He is anxiously awaiting reinforcements, 1,000 regulars and 1,000 Indians. But they don't arrive in time. And this will be the first major action of the French and Indian War in which no Indians will fight on the French side. Finally, on July 8th, General Abercrombie prepares to move his men forward in a frontal assault. Abercrombie has ordered a cannon bombardment, which should make quick work of the flimsy French defenses. He doesn't know that half his giant siege guns have sunk in the lake, and the others will take too long to deploy. To the front, march! Recover your arms! To the quick time, march! Just after noon, the highly disciplined redcoats march uphill toward the French entrenchment, supported by American provincials. Montcalm's improvised defense proves remarkably effective.
The British are slowed to a crawl. The men were cut down like grass, wrote a Massachusetts private. The ground was strewed with the dead and dying. A man could not stand erect without being hit for the bulls came by the handful. I could hear the men screaming and see them dying all around me. The attacks carry on all day. The carnage continues for nearly eight hours. Formidable Scottish Highlanders are the only British forces to get near the French wall, but even they can't prevail. Before it's over, the British and provincials will lose nearly 2,000 dead or wounded. Montcalm's casualties are only 380. Once again, the British discover that overwhelming numbers alone are not enough to produce a victory. Quel beau jour pour la France. Without Indians and almost without Canadian or colony troops, I have beaten an army of 25,000. This glorious day does infinite honor to the valor of our battalions. Ah, what soldiers are ours. I have never seen the like. Montcalm's far smaller force has driven the huge British army into a headlong retreat. After the battle, French soldiers find the shoes of British soldiers stuck in the mud. The redcoats were running so fast, they didn't even stop to retrieve them. But Montcalm's stunning victory is shallow. Without more men and supplies from France, he can't pursue the British. The Marquis sends urgent pleas for help, but he hears little in response. The defeat at Ticonderoga shatters Britain's hopes for a quick victory, along with General Abercrombie's reputation. In the wake of the disaster, a brash suggestion comes from an unlikely quarter, an American-born colonel named John Bradstreet. Bradstreet suggests a bold strike at the heart of the French-Canadian colony. Soon after the defeat at Ticonderoga, he takes a small army from Lake George to the eastern end of Lake Ontario, 250 miles through Iroquois lands. Bradstreet's soldiers are almost exclusively colonials from New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island. This is their chance to show what the Americans can do for the British cause. Their goal is the French fort Frontenac at the headwaters of the St. Lawrence River. Bradstreet orders an immediate bombardment, leaving the French no opportunity to prepare their defenses. 
Fort Frontenac surrenders within hours. Inside the fort are cannon, muskets, and food meant to supply Canada's western outposts. It's a blow from which the French Empire in North America will never recover. For Frontenac has fallen. That was merely our principal supply base for the whole of the upper country. How could this happen? Now, how shall we hold the West? The news from Fort Frontenac is bad enough, but even worse reports come from the East Coast. Canada's critical port on the Atlantic, Louisbourg, is falling to the British. Under heavy fire, Brigadier General James Wolfe leads his troops ashore. For six weeks, British and American forces lay siege to the heavily fortified city. The death knell comes when British sailors sneak into the harbor and destroy the last French battleships in Canada. The French have no choice but to surrender. The fall of Louisbourg is a turning point in the French and Indian War. If France can't halt the British advances, the loss of Canada may indeed be imminent. But there is still one place where the British have made no progress at all. The Western Frontier where this war began three years earlier. What's at stake here is the Ohio country, 200,000 square miles, an area as large as France. To control the Ohio country means dominating one spot in particular, a strategic river junction in Pennsylvania called the Forks of the Ohio River the place where Pittsburgh stands today. In 1758, the forks are firmly in French hands. They have built Fort Duquesne, which commands all river traffic in the region. But the French have another potent weapon, their long alliance with the native peoples. Dozens of Indian nations coexist in eastern North America. For a century and a half, the French have traded with and fought beside many of them. Now in this war against the English to determine who will control North America, maintaining the loyalty of those Indian allies is the only hope for France. It's a reality that the French commander has a hard time accepting. Montcalm is an old school general who wants to fight the European way, not la guerre sauvage, as he calls the Indian style of warfare. It puts him directly at odds with French Canada's civilian governor, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, who believes in using native allies to terrorize the enemy. For the Indians, forming an alliance with the French is a survival strategy. They're not fighting on behalf of France. They're fighting to maintain control over the land they see as their birthright and the French seem less likely than the English to try to take it from them. In the eyes of most British settlers and soldiers, the native people of North America are exotic and savage, ready to scalp, murder, 
or take whites captive at every opportunity. The truth is, Indians do take white settlers captive on the frontier. But the victims often have less to fear than they think. One of them, Susanna Johnson, left an account of her life as a prisoner of the Abenaki. We were in the power of unmerciful savages, without provision and almost without clothes. When I was taken with the pangs of childbirth, Susanna gives birth during the forced march north. None but a mother can understand my unhappy fortune. She names her baby captive and wonders if either of them will survive. Whenever the warriors return from an excursion against the enemy, the captives must be conducted in a triumphant form and decorated to every possible advantage. At their village, the Abenaki prepare for the ritual that greets all new captives. Each Indian took his prisoner by the hand and began to march through the gauntlet. We expected a severe beating, but they just gave us a tap on the shoulder. I was then introduced to my new family and was told to call them brothers and sisters. Susanna's eventual fate reveals one of the many strange twists this war would bring to North America. After months with her adoptive Abenaki family, she is redeemed, bought by the French, and taken to live as a prisoner of the Canadians in Montreal. Susanna's story is not unusual. The French spend considerable sums to ransom captives from the native peoples. In French Canada, the war has created a severe labor shortage. Captives help fill the gap. While for the Indians, captive taking becomes a desperately needed source of income. Voici trois lettres de Monsieur de Vaudreuil. The fortress at Louisbourg has fallen. The way to Quebec is now wide open. The English will surely pay us a visit next year. British victories along the St. Lawrence River have made Canada vulnerable. Montcalm knows the noose is tightening. We still have Niagara, which is heavily fortified. True. But how shall it be supplied? Monsieur Bradstreet has kindly destroyed our fleet at Frontenac. We must build more ships, or we shall lose control of Lake Ontario. To make matters worse, corrupt officials are sapping the French-Canadian supply system, bleeding the war effort dry. At the center is Francois Bigot, an affable man with a notorious gambling habit. <laughs> He's in charge of equipping the army, but he sells the war supplies and keeps the profits for himself and his cronies. The losers are, of course, the French soldiers. General Montcalm is furious at the greed that cripples his ability to fight the English. The official corruption no longer knows any limits. It devours all the substance of the country. It plays with men's lives. And Montcalm's pleas for help are met with only a token response. The minister has this to say. 
I have received your letter of 6th April, etc., etc. Ah. The king has seen fit to send you 800 recruits. A handful of recruits. I ask for regiments, they send recruits. 2,000 miles away in the palace of Versailles, it seems that Louis XV and Madame Pompadour, the power behind the throne, are far more invested in their European campaigns than in Canada. The fact is, France had become bogged down in a costly war in Europe that should have been an easy win. But it didn't work out that way. By 1758, the French treasury was drained and Louis XV was desperate for a European victory. Montcalm and North America would have to wait. In reply to Montcalm's repeated requests, one of the king's ministers makes the message clear. When the house is on fire, one cannot occupy oneself with the stable, monsieur. I do not know how long this can continue. There is not a man in our army who does not feel the pangs of hunger. It is much to ask of men to be brave when they are weak for want of bread. It's not just the French soldiers who feel the effects of Montcalm's supply problems. Without gifts of muskets and powder, the French will lose the loyalty of their longtime Indian allies. Three years of war are already taking a terrible toll on Indian villages. Smallpox decimates whole settlements. Hunger has become a way of life. Making peace with the English may be a matter of survival. But until the British can take Fort Duquesne at the forks of the Ohio, they'll never win the West. General Edward Braddock's devastating failure to take the forks in 1755 has left the British high command wary. No one wants to repeat Braddock's errors. So in 1758, when the British turn their attention back to Fort Duquesne, they send a general who has no illusions about what he's up against. This country is an immense, uninhabited wilderness, overgrown everywhere so that one cannot see 20 yards. General John Forbes, a determined Scotsman, will carve a road through the wilderness in a methodical way. He will build a fort or staging post every 50 miles from Philadelphia to the forks of the Ohio, a strategy designed to avoid the fate that befell Braddock's army. But Forbes realizes that to conquer Fort Duquesne, he will need to do more than just march his army through the forest. He tries something no British general has done before. He makes diplomatic overtures to the Ohio country Indians. I desire to set a treaty on foot between the Shawnee, the Delaware, and the people of Pennsylvania to deprive the French of their friendship. He will have to reverse decades of native bitterness over English duplicity. And he is seriously ill. General Forbes is determined to see Fort Duquesne fall before he dies. For help, Forbes turns to an unlikely ally, 
an eastern Delaware chief named Tidi Uskung. More than 50 years old, Tidi Uskung has a long and tangled history with both the British and the French. He had once embraced Christianity. Baptized, he took the name Gideon and hoped this new faith would help him find a secure homeland for his people and himself. I sit as a bird upon a bough. I look about and do not know where to go. Let me therefore come down upon the ground and make that my own, and I shall have a home forever. But a year into the French and Indian War, Tidi Uskung left Christianity behind and turned to war instead, attacking British settlers moving onto land that had been stolen through fraudulent treaties. Waging war seemed the best way to send a message that he and his people are a power to be reckoned with. This very ground that is under me was our land and inheritance. And was taken from us by fraud. And the Indians have suffered for it. We are not such fools. The Indians could make peace, and the Indians could break peace when it is made. As much as Titi Uskung wanted to call the shots, the reality of war made that difficult. His followers were starving, and he realized that coming to terms with the British would be the only way to achieve security and land for his people. Encouraged by Pennsylvania's pacifist Quakers, T.D. Uskung started a peace process in the Ohio country, just in time to help General Forbes. Four years earlier, it had been an Indian leader, the Half King, who triggered the war in the Ohio country. Now, a different native leader would be the key to ending it. Titi Uskung finds two men to carry the message of peace west, a Delaware chief named Piscatoman and a Delaware-speaking missionary, Christian Frederick Post. The great king of England does not incline to have war with the Indians, but wants to live in peace and love with them. If they lay down the hatchet and leave off war against them. They said to me, why do you come to fight in our land? This makes everybody believe you want to take the land from us. I said, I did not intend to take the land from them, but only to drive the French away. The Indians listen, but are skeptical. The English reputation for land swindles is hard to overcome. Forbes emissaries assure the Indian leaders that this time it will be different. Even as the diplomats do their work, General Forbes continues to cut his road through the woods toward Fort Duquesne. The dense forest isn't his only impediment. The young Virginia Colonel, George Washington, has rejoined the army for the final push to conquer the forks of the Ohio. And Washington had his own ideas about the best route the British Army should take. 
Forbes plans to build his road west from Philadelphia, the shortest possible path. Whichever route it follows, Forbes's road will pave the way for a rush of traders and settlers to the Ohio country. Washington lobbies hard to get Forbes to change his plans and instead follow General Braddock's southern route, which would favor Virginia. He doesn't hold back on his opinion of Forbes. The conduct of our leaders is tempered with something I don't care to put a name to. Forbes gets hold of a letter Washington wrote. could not discover the bottom from whence this sprang until Colonel Washington, in a letter, fairly shows himself the leader of their foolish suggestions. Indeed, I will go further and say they are dupes, or worse, to Pennsylvanian artifice, to whose selfish views I attribute this miscarriage. The Virginians came such a length as to be most singularly impertinent. It has long been the luckless fate of poor Virginia to fall victim to her crafty neighbors. We can now only bewail that blindness and wish for happier times. In the end, Washington doesn't get his way. Forbes Road carves the path that will eventually become the Pennsylvania Turnpike. In the autumn of 1758, Forbes reaps the rewards of his diplomatic efforts. The colonists sign a historic treaty with several Indian nations. The Pennsylvanians pledge no new settlements west of the Allegheny Mountains. The Indians promise peace. Tidiuskung is instrumental in bringing the sides together. In return, he has guaranteed thousands of acres for his people to build a farming community. Finally, peaceful coexistence with the white man seems within reach. By November, Forbes's army is within 50 miles of the forks of the Ohio. They're at Ligonier, the jumping off point for the final assault on Fort Duquesne. For the first time in three years, British scouts can now see the fort and try to gauge the enemy's strength. In preparation for the assault, Forbes orders two parties of soldiers to chase down raiders who stubbornly continue to harass the British. George Washington leads one of the squads. The other is commanded by his close friend, Colonel George Mercer. The two groups come across each other in heavy fog. clears for a moment, Washington realizes the terrible mistake. He throws himself between the two lines, indifferent to the musket balls flying past his head. When the friendly fire skirmish was over, two officers and 38 men were dead or wounded. Incredibly, George Washington was unhurt. 
This was only his fourth major military action and not one he could take any pride in. But no one could question his remarkable bravery or his luck. Years later, he recalled that this was the most dangerous moment of his life and speculated that perhaps uh, Providence might have spared him for some other purpose. Just two weeks later, on November 23, 1758, Forbes' army is finally ready to make its assault on Fort Duquesne. But rather than fight a battle they know they will lose, the outnumbered French destroy the fort and withdraw to Canada. Without firing a shot, General Forbes has won the prize. He renames the spot Pittsburgh for the prime minister who made victory possible. A few months later, he is dead. For five years, George Washington has been working toward this goal, wresting the forks of the Ohio away from the French. He stays only long enough to perform one sad duty. Returning to the battlefield where General Braddock and hundreds of troops were killed three years earlier, Washington's men bury the remains with overdue military honors. Since this war began, Washington has suffered painful illness and survived several brushes with death. He has made some serious blunders and been part of Britain's worst defeat in North America. But he is coming away with valuable experience forged in the fire of battle, and the lessons he's learned will not be forgotten. At age 27, he decides it's time to let others finish the war. He returns to Mount Vernon. There he will embark on two new chapters in his life. One is political. He has recently won a seat in the Virginia House of Burgesses. The other, personal. He's going home to marry Martha Custis, the wealthiest widow in Virginia. War uh, seldom brings happy endings, but for George Washington, this one came close. On his retirement from the army, he had won the respect of the men who had served under him. Perhaps more important, he had accomplished what he had set out to do. For the British, 1758 was the year that turned the tide. Finally, the empire they wanted so badly was within reach. But to grasp it would prove more painful than anyone could imagine. Next time on The War That Made America. Britain defeats France in Quebec. But the British soon discover that winning is one thing. Ruling North America will be something else entirely. The war that made America. It's not the war you think it is.
information about the series, an interactive timeline of the war, historians commentaries and classroom activities, visit our website at pbs.org. This program was made possible by Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments, Eden Hall Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the following.